Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. During this series of videos, we're going to be discussing the parts of the nephron, and we're going to see how the blood is filtered, ultimately how we reabsorb certain substances, eliminate other substances, and ultimately form urine. Okay, that's the job of the kidneys. And the individual unit of the kidney, the functional unit, is this structure which is called the nephron. Okay. In this video, we're going to talk about one part of it, which is the renal corpuscle, and that actually contains an important piece called the glomerulus. Okay. And we're also going to talk about what's called glomerular filtration rate. Before we get into that, I want to look at this nephron right here. The part that's shown over here in this larger picture is actually what's boxed over here in the smaller one. So this circular piece right here is actually the renal corpuscle. And the actual glomerulus term refers to the capillaries inside the corpuscle. So the corpuscle is like a shell. Okay, It's composed of an outer capsule, Okay, and inside that capsule there are glomerular capillaries, which is basically just a capillary bed we call the glomerulus. Okay? And this glomerulus inside the capsule is going to be what ultimately filters the blood. And whenever we filter that blood, we get what's called filtrate. And that filtrate is then going to move through this tubule system right here, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, then into what we call the loop of Henle, which has a descending limb and then an ascending limb. And then we move the filtrate into the distal convoluted tubule, and then not shown here is what's called the collecting duct. Okay? And the collecting duct ultimately is the end of it, and then that pretty much what comes out of that is the urine. And then, of course, the urine is going to travel down the ureters, into the bladder, and then ultimately through the urethra. Right? But this is actually the functional unit that actually forms that urine, and it does so by filtering the blood in here. So now let's talk about the individual pieces of the renal corpuscle. So I'm actually going to use this model for this. I like it a little bit better. Um, this entire thing right here, this whole thing, the space inside, the capillaries inside, and the outer layer of cells, this whole thing is called the renal corpuscle. It's like a shell, as I mentioned. Now, the outer layer of cells form what's called the parietal layer, and that pretty much forms the capsule itself, which we call Bowman's capsule. So that's the actual shell part. Now, the inside of the shell is hollow, except for the fact that it contains capillaries. Okay? These are collectively called glomerular capillaries, or sometimes just the glomerulus. Okay? The glomerulus is actually going to be what directly filters the blood. And then between the glomerular capillaries and the capsule itself, Bowman's capsule, there's a capsular space that's going to pretty much just be filled with the filtrate after we have the filtration process. What you should also notice is that these capillaries of the glomerulus are lined by cells called podocytes, and these podocytes create what we call the visceral layer. Okay? So these podocytes, if we look at them, notice they actually have little... Uh, gaps between them. And these gaps are spaces through which the blood is filtered and the filtrate exits the blood into the capsular space. Okay. Uh, now, there's two arterioles associated with the glomerular capillaries. We have the arteriole that feeds the glomerulus, meaning brings blood to it, and that's called the afferent arteriole, with an A. Some people refer to it as afferent, but there's also an efferent, so I prefer to actually say afferent because it really emphasizes which one it is because they kind of sound similar. But this is our afferent arteriole. This arteriole is what feeds the glomerular capillaries. Now, as blood's moving through the capillaries, eventually it will leave the renal corpuscle, and it does so through this arteriole, which is called the efferent arteriole. So that drains the corpuscle, right, or drains the glomerulus. All right. Now what you should also notice about the afferent arteriole is it has specialized cells in here that actually detect the degree of stretch of the afferent arteriole itself, and these are actually called juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells. Sometimes they're even called granular cells. We're going to talk about these uh, much later when we discuss the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Okay. Um, what you should also notice about the renal corpuscle is, if we go back to this picture right here, notice that the distal convoluted tubule, which we haven't really talked about yet, 
it actually loops around and goes right past the renal corpuscle, at least one part of the distal convoluted tubule. So this right here is a piece of the distal convoluted tubule that's looping past the renal corpuscle. And just in this region where it loops past the renal corpuscle, these cells that line the distal convoluted tubule are called macula densa cells. And that is again part of what we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which we'll talk about again in a separate video. Okay. Now what I want to mention at this point, just briefly, and then we'll get into the process of filtration, is remember that blood is ultimately moving to the glomerulus, these capillaries, through the afferent arterial. So blood moves through here and then enters this capillary network inside the corpuscle. And there's actually a high pressure inside these capillaries. And so that high pressure forces fluid out of the capillaries. And that fluid is going to exit through these little gaps between the podocytes. Okay? And that fluid, when it exits the capillaries, ends up inside this capsular space. And that is called the filtrate. Now the filtrate initially collects inside this capsular space. But notice at this bottom end of the corpuscle right here, we have what's called the proximal convoluted tubule. So after this filtrate exits through the capillaries into the capsular space, it then is going to move into this tubule network. Initially, it's going to be the proximal convoluted tubule, which we will discuss in the next video. OK, so how exactly does this filtration work? Well, it works a lot like a coffee machine. Now, this is a very primitive coffee machine. In fact, if you really know what you're doing, you don't even have to have a legit coffee maker to make coffee. You know that when you make coffee, assuming you drink it, you have an actual filter here, right? It's a piece of filter paper. And you put the coffee grinds on top, add some water, and then through a process, only some of the fluid comes through. But when you're done actually filtering the coffee, so making your coffee, what you'll notice is when you're done, you actually have the remains of the grounds up here. The grounds don't actually fall into this filtrate at the bottom. Okay? So this filter paper is acting much like the glomerulus. Okay? So only some substances are able to actually move through the filter paper and into this region of the filtrate beneath. Okay? And what passes through only has to do with size. So large particles, like the grounds themselves, don't move through the filter. Okay? They get stuck here at the top. But smaller substances, like water, um, the ingredients that make up coffee that give it this dark color, the flavorings, those small molecules, those are small enough to move through the filter. And so all that stuff ends up beneath here in the filtrate. Okay, so the filtrate is whatever is moved through. And the glomerulus is going to function in the same way. So again, if we look at this picture right here, this is the glomerular capillaries. These are the podocyte cells, and there are gaps between them. Now, there is blood moving through this afferent arterial into the glomerulus. And this blood that's moving through the afferent arterial has hydrostatic pressure. That is glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which is about 55 millimeters of mercury. Now, of course, there's pressure inside uh, the capsular space. That's about 15 millimeters of mercury. And also, there's there are some proteins inside the capsular space right here, which is going to be the blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is about 30 millimeters of mercury. So there are some forces that tend to want to keep the fluid inside the capillaries. Those are these two, the capsular hydrostatic pressure and the blood colloid osmotic pressure. But then the pressure inside the the blood itself, which is about 55 millimeters of mercury, tends to want to force the fluid out of the capillaries into the capsular space. And if we add all these pressures together, the positive ones, which is the 55, minus these two, we actually have a net filtration pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury. This is, of course, uh, changeable. You can alter this amount by doing certain things. But the bottom line is there is a net pressure that is forcing fluid from the capillaries into the capsular space. And that pressure is called net filtration pressure. And one way that we can regulate the net filtration pressure, either increase it or decrease it, is by increasing this glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. So if this pressure was to increase, 
then the net filtration pressure will increase. These two factors don't really change right here, but if we increase this glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, then the net filtration pressure increases. If we decrease the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, then we decrease the net filtration pressure. Okay? And the net filtration pressure affects what we call glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. Anything that increases the net filtration pressure increases the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. Anything that decreases the net filtration pressure decreases GFR. And so in the next slide, in just a minute, we're going to look at ways, general ways, we can regulate and change the glomerular filtration rate. That's the most important thing. Now again, before we go any further, I just want to reiterate this. The actual structure of the glomerulus is what allows filtration to occur. If we had instead a continuous capillary network where there were no or negligible spaces between the cells that line the glomerulus, then we wouldn't be able to move this fluid out and the small particles. We would have negligible or no filtration. In contrast, though, we actually have these spaces between uh, these cells of the glomerulus. Notice these podocytes have spaces in between them that allow filtration to occur. And so not only are we going to have the fluid, that is the filtrate, move out, but small particles are going to be able to move through those spaces into the capsular space where that filtrate collects, and then it will move into the proximal convoluted tubule. I'll come back to this at the end of the video, but understand that very large particles such as proteins are too large to pass through these spaces, and so they will remain in the blood. They will not be filtered and move into uh, the nephron. Okay. Now, glomerular filtration rate. This is a very important concept. It has a lot to do with physics. Okay. So how could we increase glomerular filtration rate? Well, we could just increase the net filtration pressure. So that being said, this is probably the most important concept right here. Flow in equals flow out. Okay. So let's think about first a way we can increase glomerular filtration rate. One way to do that is to increase the net filtration pressure, increase the pressure inside the glomerulus, these capillaries. The best way to do that is to dilate the afferent arterial and to constrict the efferent arterial. Well, why would this increase net filtration pressure? Because flow in equals flow out. If we dilate the afferent arterial, we're letting a lot of blood into this capillary network, the glomerulus. We're letting a lot of blood in. Now that blood, and really we're talking about the fluid as a whole, has to go somewhere, right? The fluid has to go somewhere. The flow in has to equal the flow out. Well, we're allowing only a little bit of blood to leave the glomerulus, but because the amount that flows in has to flow out, where does the rest go? We're not allowing much to leave the glomerulus through the ether and arterial, so we have a huge buildup of pressure in the glomerulus, and the only other place for that fluid to escape is to be filtrated into the capsular space. So think of it this way. The amount of blood that's moving in through the afferent arterial has two options of where to go. It can either continue as blood through the efferent arterial, or it can escape via filtration into the capsular space. And there's a certain fraction that does each. If we're allowing a lot of blood in through the afferent arterial, but not allowing much to leave through the efferent arterial, then we're increasing the pressure inside the glomerulus and then fluid escapes via filtration along with small particles, okay? Because flow in equals flow out. The amount flowing in through the afferent arterial has to equal the sum of the amount escaping via the efferent arterial plus the amount that is filtrated, okay? And so that increases the glomerular filtration rate because more is filtrating, right? or more filtering, I should say. So you dilate the afferent arterial and constrict the efferent arterial. Now, we can do the opposite as well. We can decrease glomerular filtration rate, and the way we do that is the opposite. We constrict the afferent arterial and dilate the efferent arterial. The most important thing, however, is to constrict the afferent arterial. So in this case, we're not really letting a lot of blood into the glomerulus, right? And so if we're not letting a lot of blood in, that alone would actually decrease this pressure in here. But since we're also letting a lot out, um, that blood is not really 
staying in here for very long. It's moving in here and then it's exiting very quickly because we've dilated the efferent arterial. And so because of that, this would have a much lower pressure inside the glomerulus, so a low net filtration pressure. Okay? And if we have a low net filtration pressure, then we don't really have a driving force for filtration, so we have a low glomerular filtration rate. And again, the same thing's true. The flow in equals the flow out. You know, if we consider 100% as moving in, probably about 95% of it's leaving via the efferent arterial. Okay? So there's not really much left to filter, maybe 5%. Whereas in this case up here, 100% moving in through the afferent arterial, and we're not really letting much out. Maybe only 5% is exiting via the efferent arterial, so the other has to go somewhere, so it's filtered, the other 95%. Flow in equals flow out. The fluid has to go somewhere. If it's not exiting the efferent arterial, it's being filtered. If it is e exiting the efferent arterial, then it's not being filtered. Okay, And we're going to find much later that this process of dilating or constricting the afferent arterial especially, this is going to be really important for altering the glomerular filtration rate. Now, there's really only one other thing I want to mention about the glomerulus, and it's about the size of the particles that are allowed to filter. So these spaces between the podocytes that allow movement of the filtrate out into the capsular space and then ultimately into the tubule system of the nephron, these slits are only a certain size, so they're finite, so if there are particles that are too large that can't fit through them, they don't get filtered. So things like entire cells, like a red blood cell, a red blood cell would obviously not filter through this normally. Um, large proteins will not filter through this because they can't fit through these spaces. But again, if we're talking about things like water, if we're talking about ions, cations, anions, even small peptides, glucose, amino acids, lactate, all sorts of stuff, and of course waste products, those are small enough to filter through these slits. And so they're going to move into the capsule right here, the capsular space, and then ultimately into the tubule. But let me ask you a question. Do we want to be getting rid of glucose? Do we want to be getting rid of amino acids? Do we want to be getting rid of all these ions in the blood and water? No. So this filtration system is not specific to different molecules. It doesn't say, ah, we need to hold on to water. We need to hold on to amino acids, so we'll, we just won't filter them. No, the only, the only thing the glomerulus sees is the size. So if it's small enough, it fits through and it gets filtered into here. But we obviously don't want to lose all of that, right? So the job of the remainder of the nephron and we'll begin by talking about the proximal convoluted tubule, is to make sure we don't lose all of these goodies. Glucose, amino acids, water. We want to hold on to a lot of that stuff, and so we're going to see that the job of the rest of the nephron is to reabsorb those things, among other things. All right? So hopefully you understand a little bit about the glomerulus and the renal corpuscle and filtration. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we'll pick up with the proximal convoluted tubule. Thank you.